Good morning, everybody. Oh, John Allen here, and, and uh, welcome, and I'm glad you guys are here this morning. It's right at 8 o'clock right now, so we're going to give everybody a, f um, a few more minutes to join. Um, but while while we're doing that, just a few housekeeping things. Um, yeah, everybody is muted right now. Um, we'll open up the lines for uh, questions and um and discussion at the end of the presentation, but um, just to keep down on background noise and things like that, we're going to keep everybody's line muted for now. Um, if you need to get my attention, uh, there's a number of ways that you can do that through the interface. You can send me um, a chat. You can send. You can raise your hand if you have a question. Um, but uh, I think we're going to move pretty fast this morning because I've got a lot of material that I'd like to cover with you guys. And um, we'll open it up at the end. So, uh, what else? Am I missing anything? Well, let's go ahead and get started then. Um, so, like I said, my name is John Allen. I'm product manager here at at High Security, and uh, we're going to be talking this morning about inductive vehicle loop detectors. So let's have a look here. Are you seeing this? Um, so here's here's our agenda this morning. Um, the question on the table is, are all vehicle detectors the same? Um, well, yes. In some ways, they're all the same. They all work on the same um, principles of physics. But in other ways, uh, they're very different, and our solution is different from just about everything else on the market. And we're going to talk a little bit about um, what you can gain by pairing a vehicle detector with a gate operator. So let's let's get started with just some just a f refresher on on basic physics. Um, you probably all remember from high school that anytime there's an electric current, there's a magnetic field associated with it. So if you have a, a current running through a straight wire, it doesn't matter if it's AC or DC, there's always a, a magnetic field created by that current moving through the wire. Um, if you take that wire and you coil it, the magnetic field gets concentrated because you have a field over each pass of the wire and those fields kind of stack up on each other and get stronger and stronger and stronger. And then the last thing that you need to know is that um, there's a, actually a lot of energy that is stored in the magnetic field. So it takes a while for that energy to build up and takes a while for that energy to discharge. And that's what we call an inductor. Um, every Every um, loop detector uses um, some kind of oscillating circuit, creates an oscillating circuit in the loop. I'm a mechanical engineer by training, so I have to compare everything in the world to a mechanical analog. So I start thinking about things like this as a, uh, a mass on a spring. That's a simple um, oscillating mechanism that everybody's familiar with. So if you, if you can imagine a weight hanging on a spring, if you were to pull down on the weight and then let go, what's going to happen is that it's going to bounce up and down. You know, it's going to go boing, 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 and at a very nice regular um, frequency. And if you if you make changes to that system, if you change the mass, for example, let's say you, you make the mass ten times as much as it was before, instead of going boing, 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 it's going to go much slower, boing, boing, right? And then the same thing is true if you um, make it much, much lighter. It goes much, much faster. Now, the, the electrical equivalent is um, this oscillating circuit that I've drawn. So what I've, what I've got here is a battery and a capacitor and an inductor. And if you, um, if you switch the switch over here to A, then the battery is going to charge up the capacitor. And you're going to end up with a bunch of electrons on one side of the capacitor and a potential difference across it. Then when you switch it to B, the capacitor is going to discharge because it's got an open it's got a circuit, complete circuit to the from the positive side to the negative side through an inductor. 
And as the current goes through the inductor, it's going to build up a magnetic field. And the electrons are going to move from one side of the capacitor to the other side of the capacitor through the inductor, creating an electrical current. And pretty soon, the charge state of the capacitor is going to reverse. So that's just like a spring going from being um, stretched out to being compressed. Then once that happens, just like with the spring system, everything's going to turn around and go the other way. And the current's going to flow back the other way through the inductor, charge up the other side of the capacitor until the voltage is flipped again, and then it's going to turn around and go the other way. So it's very much like this um, reciprocating spring thing that I've drawn here. So th this is how uh, detectors work then. You have your inductor, which in this case is a wire coil that is embedded in a roadway, and you have a detector which creates an oscillating current inside that inductor. And then that current then will create a magnetic field above the roadway. And I've shown the f this field as this perfect rectangular box, but in reality it's not that at all. The closer you are to the inductor, the stronger the field is going to be, and the farther away you are, the weaker it is. And if you move far enough away, then you know there's essentially no magnetic field at all. But, th but there are no real discrete boundaries to it. Now, anything that you're going to put in this magnetic field is going that conducts electricity is going to change the inductance. So if you put something in there that conducts electricity, the inductance is going to change. The frequency of the oscillating circuit then changes just a little bit because it's just like changing the mass on that spring and ch shift the, the frequency of the system just a little bit. And then the, tech, the detector is going to see that shift in frequency and say, oh, there's a corresponding shift in inductance. Um, there must be something in the magnetic field. Maybe it's a car. <laughs> So that's how all vehicle inductant detectors work. The frequency that's going on in the loop is, is actually fairly high, anywhere from 15,000 hertz to 70,000 hertz or kilohertz, 15 to 70 kilohertz. Um, the smaller the loop is, the higher the frequency is going to be. And we're looking for very small changes in inductance because we have a very big loop. Um, it, it's very low inductance, and as we move things into the field, we're going to see little shifts in inductance, which means that you need a pretty precise machine, electrical machine, to measure these changes, which means that if the loop isn't installed right, um, you can have all kinds of problems. If there's any kind of shifting in the ground or a, a nick in the installation, insulation or a leakage current from the wire to the to ground, or even changes in the in the position or location of the lead-in wires going up to the loop, any little shift at all can cause a little shift in inductance, which could fake the detector out into thinking that there's a car in the in the field. We're looking at we're looking for signals on the order of one-tenth of one percent to as low as one one-hundredth of one percent in order to make a determination. So it's a very sensitive uh, machine. I want to talk a little bit about sensitivity um, because it's it's not like like you would think about in a ordinary circuit where you have an amplifier on a voltage and so you, you know, things get bigger. There's no way to amplify the kind of signals that we're looking at with a with a loop detector. So what you have to do is to get better at detecting small changes. So what I've drawn here is um, a roadway. I've got a loop buried in it, um, and we've just kind of sliced through the loop. And you can see these um, field lines emanating from the loop out into space. And up above the roadway, but it's important to know that they also go down below the roadway, which normally doesn't matter unless there's something down there, like if you're on a parking garage or something um, and there are vehicles on the level below you, 
there's a chance that you might see vehicles going through the magnetic field on the level below. And the wire, coil wire isn't going to be able to know or care the difference. Um, I'll get to that. So as a car moves into the field, the signal starts to change. We have a signal level that's rising here. And, and at some point, it's going to get high enough that it trips the detector. And it goes into detect mode. I'm calling it call. It's a call state. Um, but, but we all know that what happens is it just it changes state. It goes from there's nothing here to there's something here. And then as the car progresses across the loop, the signal gets stronger and stronger until it maxes out. Then it starts to drop off. And at some point, the detector is going to release the state and say, whatever was there is gone now. And there's a, a difference in level between tripping the detector and uh, releasing the detector. Um, and, and we do that on purpose because we don't want something that just barely has a strong enough signal to trip the detector to cause a condition where the where the detector would say, um, I've got something, I don't have anything. I got something, I don't have anything. I got something, I don't have anything at 15,000 times a second. So we <laughs> we put a little gap in there so that, you know, so that it gets up over that threshold and it says, yes, I've got something. And then when it falls down below a, a lower threshold, say, okay, it's gone now. So that's um, in... In engineering, we call that hysteresis. Let's uh, look at what happens when you have a truck, though. Um, a truck is kind of a different thing. It has higher clearance over the roadway in general, and when the trailer is um, over the center of the loop, the clearance is very high. And as I mentioned, the, since the magnetic field gets weaker, the farther away you get from the coil, when the trailer is over that coil, it's it's a much farther distance than it would be if, say, you had a car over the coil. So what you get is um, this kind of valley in the signal as the car go, as the truck goes by, and when it's centered over the loop, you get this this lower signal. Then as the back axles pass over the loop, the signal starts to rise again, and then when the truck passes by, it drops, and and this is why they invented this thing called boost. Because if you if you had set this release level like you would for a car, knowing that a car went by, you would start the gate closing while the trailer was still in the field. And then you have a problem where the gate closes on the trailer. So for trucks, we have this secondary release point that we call boost. Boost is a terrible name. I don't know who, who originally came up with that, but nothing is actually getting boosted. What we've actually done is we've lowered the threshold for when, where we release the call so that we're not fooled by things like high clearance vehicles that have a weak signal. And then once that's gone, um, we pass on by. So just to kind of give you a, a sense for the difference in strengths of the different kinds of vehicles, um, I'm showing this comparison here. Now this isn't to scale or anything. Um, this is just kind of meant to make a point that um, a car, because of its low clearance, generates a much stronger signal than a truck. And then if you have a motorcycle, and if anybody who rides a motorcycle has probably experienced this, um, the signal there is just much, much less, not because the clearance is low, but because there's just not that much, um, they don't cover that much area in the field. They don't take up much, that much of the magnetic field, so they generate a very weak signal. And I've drawn everything here as a nice, smooth curve, but, but in reality, there's noise in the signal and, and um, other things that affect the signal. And if you set the release point too low or the call point too low, you run the risk of um, tripping the detector for, for no reason at all. So let's say you're trying to tune the detector to, to, to detect a motorcycle. You're going to change the sensitivity and drop that call threshold way, way low. But now something happens like uh, 
it rains and the ground gets wet, which changes the inductance just a little bit, or the sun comes out and the temperature changes, changes the inductance just a little bit. And now it might think that there's um, something in the field when there's nothing in the field and go into that call state. And when that happens, the detector locks up. And the same thing can happen when you go to release something. Maybe maybe the, the error in the signal isn't enough to put it into the call state, but it's too high to ever get below the threshold to release it, and so your detector locks up. So that's the tricky thing about, um, about detecting motorcycles with a vehicle loop detector. So that's kind of the basics of how um, all loop detectors work and some of the problems associated with loop detectors. Um, I want to switch a little bit now and talk about um, what you can do when you have a loop detector that it's di designed to work and paired with a gate operator, which is what we've done with the HY5A. And um, in about a month, we'll be releasing a new version of that, the HY5B that has some really cool tricks that it can do because it's paired with a gate operator. Um, so I'm going to focus my um, discussion from here on on the new product, HY5B, but a lot of the things that I'm saying here have been true all along with our HY5A. New things with our HY5B, though, um, we now have an automatic algorithm for setting the sensitivity. So that takes the guesswork out of it. Um, we have better ways of detecting motorcycles and worrying about um, those call states and those noise levels, and I'll talk more about that. Um, we've developed a way to compensate for gates. Um, when there's a gate nearby and it moves um, through the magnetic field, it can change things a little bit, and um, because we're, we're connected to the gate, we can um, do some fun things with that. We've improved its lightning immunity in a couple of ways. We've added some new um, diagnostics that tools to help you um, diagnose and troubleshoot problems in the field. And we've added the ability to actually count vehicles. So let's, let's talk about automatic sensitivity. The way the HY5B works, well, let me back up. The way the HY5A works is there's a dial on it and it's a user selectable sensitivity and there are eight different settings um, four with boost and four without boost. The HY5B kind of does all of that automatically and and since it since we know that every loop is different we kind of start with a nominal setting and then we look at the first couple of vehicles that go across the loop and say okay this is how this loop is performing and we adjust that call level automatically to, to have the right thresholds above the noise floor, but, but sensitive enough to detect cars and trucks. And then same thing with the release level. The default, of course, will be having boost on. Right? Um, we, can, we can adjust that if we need to. Uh, and then, then as the HY5B goes through its life in service, um, it continuously calibrates to cars. So it keeps a, an average of the cars that go over the loop and continuously tweaks and adjusts where the call level is for each car. For, um, not for each car, but for the average. And then the final thing that we can do is, is I mentioned that we have, um, some loop health statistics. We actually look at that loop health and make sure that we are not setting the sensitivity too high for a loop that's showing degraded health. Um, automatic gate sensitive compensation. Automatic gate compensation is the trick that we use to make detecting motorcycles easier. So if you look at my chart here, I've, I've shown a very sensitive uh, detector set up to detect motorcycles. Uh, so it has a very low call threshold and a very low release threshold and it works just fine for motorcycles. The problem is if you have a swing gate that goes that closes from one time to the other 
it's going to change the signal in in the loop just a little bit and it may not fall down below that release point and the same thing is true about a slide gate so so here is a source a source of um, interference if you will or a, a, a environmental thing that changes the inductance of a loop every single time in a very predictable way and if only the loop detector knew where the gate was and how much signal it created then it could just subtract that out and then you wouldn't have that interfering with your ability to detect motorcycles and that's exactly what we do the HY5B communicates with the gate operator the, the operator tells it the location of the gate and it memorizes what the signal level generated by the gate is for each location as it goes through and subtracts that out. So it's like the gate becomes invisible to the detector. So if you have that and, and it's automatically on in every case anyway, then you can lower your call thresholds and detect motorcycles. So there is a mode that we put it into the detector where you can turn it on and now you have this motorcycle mode and you can be trying to detect motorcycles. It's not a perfect system, but it, it definitely makes things better. Uh, loop diagnostics is another new thing in the HY5B. Um, there are a lot of things that can go wrong with a loop over time. Um, there can be degraded insulation, there can be um, cuts or nicks in the insulation, there can be um, settling of a roadway or cracks in the roadway or all kinds of things. Um, so we actually look at three different parameters that give us an indication for how the, how the loop is doing over time. We look at um, RF noise in, in the loop. So in, in some senses, this great big loop out there is really just a big radio antenna. And if there are electrical wires nearby or something, um, it can be picking up stray um, RF signals from those wires and if those signals are strong enough it can make detecting anything very difficult. So we actually look at that and score that on a, on a scale of 0 to 7 where 7 is a perfect score and if you're seeing low scores in that you might be looking for what other kind of um, infrastructure is around that could be generating RF noise. We look at STEP, which is a um, sudden and permanent change in, in inductance. So this would be something that would be indicating maybe a loose connection or a bad splice um, or a shift in the roadway, a crack in the roadway or something that like that appears, or maybe even a broken wire. Uh, so if you get a, a low score on that, you think maybe there's, there's um, something sudden that changed in the roadway. And then we look at the reference um, frequency of the loop and how that changes and stabilizes over time. And if we see reference frequency drifting um, a lot throughout the day or from, from hour to hour, we'll lower the score on that. The scores are stored in the event log on the gate operator. So you can just um, go to the gate operator and look at the event log, you can scroll through that on the display or um, download it to a computer. And once a day, the loop scores are stored in the event log and you can look at how things have been trending over time. You can also go to the display and look for things like um, the loop frequency. And these are things that you want to do if you have adjacent lanes where you maybe have two loops um, next to each other, but they're, the detectors are on different um, gate operators. Uh, you want to be sure that there's at least 3,000 hertz of separation between loops from one lane to the next. And so you can just go into the display and see what the frequency of each loop is set at. And if you have conflict, if they're too close to each other, you can change the frequency of one of the loops. You can even look at what the um, inductance is. Um, you want to make sure that your, the inductance of your loops is at least 50 
microhenries. That's the unit of measure for inductance. I don't know where that came from. Um, a good loop will be 100 microhenries or more. We've added the ability to count cars. And not only that, um, you know, you can, you can imagine that if you see one of these peaks go by, you say, oh, that's a car, send a signal to the gate and say, you know, a car went by. But we can actually even see when two cars go by um, if they're tailgating. And, and we don't even need for that call state, that detect state, to, to change at all. Um, we can just tell there were two big peaks, and so there were two cars that went through. The gate didn't close between them. The call state on the detector didn't even drop, but we still know. So we can record that as two cars going through, and we can send an alert. Um, and if you have HiNet connected to this, you can receive an alert that there's been a um, access violation. Tailgating. Tailgating. Of course, you can back up and set it in manual sensitivity. Um, you can do this um, if the if the loop health indicates that um, boost is a bad idea and you want to turn boost off. This is the way that you do that. Um, you can go in and choose the same levels of sensitivity that we had previously in the HY5A. You know, four sensitivities with boost on and four sensitivities with boost off. Um, another reason that you might want to do that is if you're in an environment where it never sees a car, where, and, and that's like less than one car per 200 vehicles, um, you're going to want to send it to manual sensitivity for that uh, because the detector is always looking for a car. And it, it ignores trucks. If it sees a car every now and then, it can tell the difference between cars and trucks. And it's calibrating its call and release points continuously to car traffic and then scaling it there from there to where they should be for a truck. But if it never sees a car, um, it's going gonna, it's gonna to start tuning itself for trucks instead of cars. And the problem that you would get with that then is that it might lower the sensitivity to the point where, um, where you could start getting lockups or false trips. So if, so if you're in that kind of environment where, where it's a truck gate and only trucks ever go by, you probably want to switch it to manual sensitivity. I mentioned that we had um, improved lightning immunity. We've um, done a couple of things. Um, one is that we've added a hardware protection grounding point. Where you can run a ground wire from this spade terminal to the grounding rod to protect the hardware from nearby lightning strikes. Um, the other thing that we've done is we've added some um, signal filtering where we look at the momentary changes caused by lightning nearby. And this doesn't even have to be something that strikes a gate or strikes the coil or anything like that. It could just be nearby and the RF noise created by the lightning. Um, we were able to now detect that and distinguish it between a car or a truck or anything like that on the loop and ignore those signals. So the so we filter out that kind of thing to reduce the instances of um, artificial trips. And so so the the problem that we're trying to avoid here is if you have a free exit loop and lightning strikes nearby, it opens the gate. Um, we're smart. We've tried to build it to have the smarts to ignore that kind of input. For retrofits, there is the HY5A emulation mode. So if you have an older gate and you want to um, install a new detector for some reason, maybe you're putting in a new loop or maybe the detector has failed, um, HY5B is compatible with all um, of our older Smart Touch and Smart DC controllers. Um, without any kind of software update, it will just act like an HY5A, and as far as the gate is concerned, um, it thinks there's an HY5A plugged in. Um, you still get the automatic sensitivity, um, but you don't get any of the other um, new features. Um, so you can't set the sensitivity manually, you can't see the loop diagnostics, and you don't get the automatic gate compensation. 
but you get everything else that, that the HY5A has. So that is um, a quick overview of loop detectors and the HY5B. I'm going to open the, uh, the lines up now for questions. Um, and I've got one here in the room. Richard Walcher, do you have a question? Yeah, so what is the software revision that enables the newest features of HY5B? Oh, uh, you need at least um, 4.55 for the Smart Touch and 5.54 for the Smart DC. And approximately when did those? January. We we'll started shipping in January. January. Yeah, so they've been out there for a while. How do I how do I unmute everybody? Where's my button? Can you help me? I have another question. Here. There we go. For the winners, they need it. They just have to ask questions. You can send me a, a chat if you have a question. I can't unmute everybody. I can't unmute you. Unmute you. So use the chat interface if you have a question for me. So what are the at a practical level, I think you've gone through that, but if you could restate it again. What are the, it's, you've given us a lot of detail about how these sophisticated uh, vehicle detectors work, and work with loops and work with smart touch. From a practical perspective, what's, how is this going to impact an installer who goes out there? How's, how likely is it that he's going to have to dig deep and figure out how to do something different than he's normally used to being doing, you know, he's normally used to doing. You don't, okay, so the question, Richard's question is, um, what are the practical implications about what new you have to do uh, when you're installing one of these? And I guess the, the basic thing is, um, there's one additional step that you need to do when you're installing one of these on a gate, and that is to calibrate the um, gate compensation. And you do that by opening and closing the gate when there's nothing else on the loop. And that's it. You have to open and close the gate one time while there's nothing on the loop, and the automatic gate compensation is calibrated, and everything is going to work just fine. So that one additional step gets, that you have to do. Now, all of these other things provide you more tools in your toolbox for fixing things that go wrong. So the loop health scores is a great way of knowing what to fix when you have a problem. Um, before, you're just kind of blind and had to guess. So you change what's easy to change. And it's easy to change a loop detector because you can unplug the old one and plug in a new one. And, um, and that's an easy test to do. And you have no way of knowing whether you're doing the right thing or not. It's just something to do. Um, with the loop health scores now, um, you can have you know, quantitative information about what the right thing to do is, and you can know ahead of time if swapping the detector out is going to help or not. So does it provide an alert when it notices that the loop is failing? It does a number of things when the loop is failing, um, but the alert comes in, in, um, in the scores that are recorded on a daily basis. So you actually have to go into the smart touch control and take a look at, at the uh, alerts, faults, and errors and figure that out. It's not coming up with loop failure. Uh, that, yeah, that's right. Okay. That's right. Okay, I've got a couple of uh, questions coming in. Um, uh, question about, is this compatible with other brand operators? Uh, unfortunately, it is not. Um, this is this is a proprietary system. It is designed to communicate with the Smart Touch and the Smart DC controller. Um, there aren't any other gates out there that have that kind of communication capability. So so really, it's it's a high security specific solution. A uh, question about pricing. Um, are they the same price? Uh, and I believe the answer is yes. I'm, if, I'm, there's a, if there's a price modification, I don't know that right now, it's tiny. Yeah, 
it, it may be affected by our um, annual price increase, um, but I think that it will be um, priced the same. Uh, question about when are they available? Um, we will be um, shipping them starting on June 1st. That's that's the plan as it stands right now, and you know how those things go. And it's going to be we're going to be shipping both products for a while. Is that not the case? Both products, both HY5A and HY5B, will be available for some time. We have a limited supply of HY5As, and when they're gone, they're gone, and we won't be getting more. A uh, question about upgrading old operators. Yes. So if you have an older operator and you need to swap out the detector and you want to get the new loop diagnostics, um, a software upgrade is all that's needed. Um, the smart touch needs to be um, version 4.54 minimum. The smart DC needs to be 5.54 minimum, and anything later than that will be compatible. So it's it's a um, pretty easy upgrade if you use a, a cable and a, there are start um, software on a laptop and upgrade anything in the field. However, you don't have to upgrade, right? You don't have to upgrade. If you want to run in HY5A emulation mode, you don't have to do anything. Uh, next question. Um, will this presentation be available to download? Sure. We can, we can put it up on our um, installer portal and you can download it from there. And um, I've got shaking heads in here. The people who do these things are saying they will ha be happy to do that. Uh, well, sorry, I may have missed this as I joined late, but when will it be available? Okay, we covered that. Uh, what else? Any other questions out there? Yeah, can you talk a little bit more about why is that counting feature valuable? Why is the counting feature valuable? Um, that feature is was designed for the parking industry. And the idea is that, that if you have a high net connected to your gate, then you can remotely access the traffic data through a gate. And if you have more than one gate, maybe you have an entrance gate and an exit gate or a couple of entrance gates and a couple of exit gates, you can access traffic data from all of the gates and know how many, um, what the occupancy is of your, of your parking lot. So this is information that, that you can access remotely. You can make it available to um, your parking applications. You can throw it up in the cloud if you want. You can have your people, you know, whatever solutions you might imagine um, might be made available by having that data. Um, the other thing, and this is a cool trick, um, our um, strong arm park has has multiple inputs for um, for operating the gate. We have uh, we have the ability to count transients and tenants and um, other kinds of gate opens, and we can associate those um, with traffic. So um, if you have a mixed use parking lot where a certain number of stalls are designated for um, tenants and certain number of stalls are for hourly parking, um, you can keep track of those um, inventories separately. So all of that data is made accessible remotely by HiNet, and, which interfaces to um, any of our gate operators, but in this case specifically the strong arm park. H55B is $5 less than H55A. Good news, everybody. We're giving you a price break on the HY5B. It's we priced it just under the HY5A, five bucks. Could you one more time explain what the risk is for having boost versus when you want to turn it off? So the question is, um, what what risks do you incur when you turn boost on? Um, the risk that you incur is that that if you have a noisy signal, a bad loop. Um, a shift in inductance as a vehicle transits over a loop, like uh, maybe a shifty roadway in a heavy truck or something like that, that the signal will never drop down low enough to release below the release threshold on the loop and that the 
the detector will remain in that call state um, forever. Now, it, it won't remain in that call state forever because um, we look at things like that and um, we're continuously making adjustments for the vacant loop frequency. Um, but you don't want your gate left open, and it could be, it could be several minutes, it could be several hours that the, the gate is left open uh, because of that. So um, in those cases, you'd want to raise the um, release threshold by turning boost off. Um, I did mention that you know since we're monitoring the loop scores, and if we're seeing um, squirrely behavior on the loops, we will kick up that boost release threshold above a minimum floor and keep the detector from being overly sensitive. So we're trying to compensate for that a little bit. We can't compensate for every scenario, but we try to build as much of that capability into the detector automatically as we can. This probably should explain why if you turn boost off and you have some on truck traffic, though, you're at risk of end game hitting the truck. So therefore, it's time to replace the boost. Brian Denault joined us, and he reminds me that we offer boost for a reason, and um, turning it off um, defeats that. So, you know, at some point, if you have truck traffic and a bad loop and and they're locking up because the boost threshold is too low, and um, at some point you're going to want to cut in a new loop. Um, but we can help you with that in knowing when it's time to do that. Uh, one more question here. Uh, will the HY5A be discontinued? Yes, it will. Um, we have a limited supply of HY5As, um, several months supply, so they're going to be around for a while, but we won't be getting any more. But what kind of testing has been done to ensure that when I install this thing, I'm not going to you know, suffer the bleeding edge of a new product? So the question is um, from Richard. How have we tested and qualified the product? Um, we've we've actually had a very successful uh, beta test campaign. Um, we have um, quite a, a number of these installed. Um, a lot of them here in the um, Seattle area, um, but really all over the country. We have them installed down in Texas. We have them in Arizona, Colorado, um, a number of places, and um, what we found is that that it's a very reliable product. Uh, we did find a few software bugs. Um, that's what you want when you're doing a beta test program because we want to find the bugs with our beta test customers and not not um, in the general market. Um, we're we are very confident in in this device. Uh, I think it's rock solid. The last few tweaks that we've done on the software have been, um, I would call it, uh, putting a high polish on it, spit shine. Um, it's, it is a rock solid product at this point. It scares me a little bit, being an installer, that I don't have that manual control over sensitivity that I used to have. Should I be concerned? Well, you do have manual control. The question is, what, um, should I be worried about not having manual control? If you need it, you have manual control. You have to go through the, um, through the smart touch or smart DC interface to change it instead of turning a dial on the detector. But you can change it. But, but the question is, how do you know? How do you know what to change it to? Um, the, the truth is that you're just guessing. You're just guessing. You have a problem. You think, well, maybe I'm going to switch it a little bit. Um, we tried to take the guesswork out of it, which is why we, why we did the automatic um, sensitivity in the first place. So we have the ability to actually measure the signals and measure the noise floor and measure all the other things that are going on and choose the, the detect points and the release points based on actual measurements. So there may be, like I said, if you need to turn boost off or something like that, or if you have have a lot of truck traffic, like like pure truck traffic, then you might want to change it. But for the most part, I would I would recommend that you trust the machine to pick the sensitivity for you. It's smarter than all of us. 
And and when you set it manually, you have four different discrete points that you can change. When it's setting it automatically, it's not choosing between four points. It's looking at an average of you know 65 cars that have gone by and picking just the right point for the for the traffic that exists. And it's not necessarily has to pick one of those four sensitivity points. So it's it gets the calibration just right. So, so, so I get it at some level. Tell me why I should be using this piece of equipment that's high security proprietary H55A or H55B versus a box detector. What's the big takeaway here? Well, the big takeaway is that um, that in communicating with the gate, that that you get two things. One, you get um, a more robust user interface. You get all of the um, feedback that you get from the display on the smart touch or the smart smart DC board, which is something that you might not get with a with a box detector. But you get the ability to count vehicles and you get the ability to share information on where the gate is. So a box detector is nothing more than a switch that turns on and off. And the gate can't tell it any more than just, just I'm, you know, here's some power. And in exchange for giving you some power, you tell me on or off. Um, with this, the gate and the detector can share a lot more information. And um, vehicle counts and gate position are Two of two really um, good pieces of information to share. So box detector is a dumb switch. <laughs> All right. It's a switch. A box it's detector a is a switch. You can call it dumb. Uh, I have another question coming in off the web. Um, oh yeah, I'm reminded that. Um, that crosstalk is another thing that a box detector can't do. Um, so when when you have all of your detectors connected to a gate, um, they can coordinate their behavior to make sure that they're not getting crosstalk between adjacent loops. And um, so, yeah, there's there's probably others. There is. So I, I picture uh, if you turn power on for the detector and operator when the car is parked over the loop, you know that we store the vacant loop frequency and we can come up in a call state versus yes. that car as normal. Brian reminds me that um, that we actually store the calibration data um, in a um, even even in the event that there's a power loss. So so if the power goes out and the power comes back on Everything resets, uh, but you don't have to recalibrate the loop. So if there happens to be a vehicle sitting on the loop when the power comes back on, the detector goes directly into the call state. So that is different from what a box detector would do. You know, just tune the car to which, environmental normal. Fire the closed timer, the gate operator, and smash the car. Did they do that? Uh, we are running really late. Uh, thank you guys for um, for sticking with me for this, but um, I am going to wrap things up at this point. Um, if you have any questions, you're welcome to give me a call. Uh, call me here at High Security, or you can send me an email. Uh, my email address is jallen at highsecurity.com, and I'll be happy to answer any questions that you have. Um, Thank you, everybody, for your attention and for coming. I hope this was a valuable um, time for you. And uh, we're going to call that good. I'll see you guys next time.